and um, I, I on behalf of our department of english um i i pay my special appreciation to dr maria priti shrivasan and uh, this symposium has served as a platform for so many research minds to explore literature in different dimensions and um, today's topic is uh, for the symposium is memory and literature literature and memory studies and memory studies is an academic field of uh, studying the use of memory as a tool of remembering the past it can be seen in two dimensions one is revisiting the past recalling the past or revisiting the text the canonical text and analyzing and exploring the text from the vantage of uh, as a memory study and uh, because uh, the subject of invest i mean this explorative study is actually just begun since the 20th century by so many psychologists and cognitive scientists and um, i extend my warm welcome to you uh, uh, sir uh, dr h uh, abdul hadi associate professor of new college associate professor of english new college um, sir i think uh, um, we have uh, been doing a refresher uh, course in uh, madras university i mrs balambike i uh, yes ma'am mrs yes, yes. i remember so, seeing I you yeah i know i was very happy um, yeah. to meet you again sir uh, thank you ma'am thank you ma'am yes ma'am and, and uh, talking about our uh, keynote speaker he is an erudite scholar because in various uh, um, interchanges of uh, ideas in the resource uh, i mean in the i mean in the uh, sessions i have seen him giving very good insights in the form of a feedback and so i remember this and this session i'm sure that it would be a very enriching session to our students and the research scholars and uh, we have two uh, paper presenters today uh, mr mohammad badud and who is a phd research scholar from the central university of kerala and ms saishri and who is a lecturer from the department of science and uh, from bangalore i warmly welcome all of you and uh, i will hand over the session to blessy now sir thank you ma'am welcome sir blessy you can uh, just uh, take over the session now i request dr abdul hadi sir to take over the proceedings uh, thank you ma'am uh, uh, thank you ma'am for uh, the nice words you have said about me uh, uh, most respected organizers of this event and respected head of the department uh, dr preeti ma'am faculty members from different institutions and uh, research scholars and academicians and those who are present for the meeting very 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 good evening to all of you <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to share some of my views on this topic literature and memory studies at the outset i would like to uh, give you a kind of a disclaimer because um, you know Uh, see this topic was just informed yesterday and i could read only a very little on this so with that limited reading a little understanding of the subject you know i have just developed some uh, perspectives which i would like to share with you all <clears throat> uh, friends to answer the question what memory studies is and what it is all about we should know what memory is as we all know memory is a psychological a psychological process or a faculty of the mind which encodes data from the outside the world or which collects uh, data from outer sources and stores it and retrieves it as and when it is required so we understand that memory involves three major processes what are they we are encoding storage and retrieval so human memory has the ability to preserve and recover information but please remember 
this process is not a flawless one. This process has certain flaws within it. It has certain problems within it. And all of you will, will agree with me that memory is something very, very abstract in nature. Memory is very subjective and it can also be very, very personal sometimes. So even for the same event, different people will have different memories of it. And all those memories are equally valid. As such, memory is very versatile, very democratic and very accommodating in nature. It, the definition of memory changes according to the lens we look at it. For instance, uh, the neuroscientist will look at the biological basis of memory and they will explore the brain structures or the mechanisms responsible for memory formation. And, and psychologists will look at the cognitive process that involves encoding, storage and retrieval. And, and philosophers will look at the ontological existence of memories or the logical process behind the formation of memories. And, and, so, and historians will analyze how societies remember and forget events or forget memories. And sociologists will try to explore how memory aids in social identity or social cohesion. So we understand that memory means different things to different people. Even to understand what memory is, it requires a kind of uh, cross-disciplinary framework. Because all these disciplines, uh, for instance, psychology, philosophy, or anthropology, they involve memory at some or other level. They need, I mean, they deal with memory, they deal with memory at some point of time, or they deal with memory at some or other level. We look at memory. Now, I mean, most of us remember that memory is just all about uh, remembering. But again, as I stated earlier, it's a three-tire process, which, include, which includes encoding, consolidation, and retrieval. And all this process must function so that, the, the, so that memory can function properly. So all these processes are important if you want memory to function well. And however, as I stated in the beginning of my talk, the process of memory, it has certain flaws. It is not flawless because the process of memory is a very, very biased process because the, the brain is hardwired to be biased. It, it is a biased mission in the sense, you now we have a different kinds of biases, uh, could be cognitive biases, could be uh, religious biases, could be emotional biases. And all these biases will shape the process of what will get encoded in the brain. So all these biases will determine what memory will get stored. So this is a very basic understanding of a memory. For example, out of 100 people you meet in a party, you will remember just a couple of them because, or you might remember just one or two for the simple reason that they come from your place or they speak the same language or they just practice your faith, right? Or they, they resemble somebody who you love. So these biases, make you remember that particular person. And what, let's say, what X remembers in a party will be different from what Y remembers in a party. And these memories are induced by the biases. This remembrance are induced by the biases. As I said, you know, the various kinds of biases. At the same time, when you remember something, let's say in an event, you also leave out something. 
So when you remember something, you also leave out certain bits of information and thereby, you know, you are very selective about approaching it. So what we understand from this is if we are, if we, are, we have to remember something, we also have to forget something. So remembering and forgetting always go hand in hand. So every act of memory has also an act of erasure. So, so what we understand from this is, so the process of memory is not just a passive phenomenon, but an active one, but an activity. And they, they don't just operate at the personal level, even at the collective level. For instance, every nation or every community or every culture will, will try to remember certain events. Well, we'll have certain, I mean, we'll, we'll have certain emotions or certain events. So they will try to commemorate these memories through museums or through memorials. For instance, let's take an example of Indian independence. See, we commemorate or we remember or we celebrate Independence Day so that we want people to understand the value of independence and we want them to remember the sacrifices of the heroes who fought for independence. And thereby, we want the national identity to remain intact or we do that deliberately so that some sort of uh, solidarity is created among people so it has a motive and coming to forgetting and forgetting is a very very uh, crucial aspect of memory studies so it it raises questions like you now why and how uh, you know we forget certain things and how uh, I mean, what kind of a role memory or forgetting plays in personal and collective memory? And, you know, there are different kinds of uh, forgetting. For instance, uh, uh, accidental forgetting. Hmm? Accidental forgetting is a very uh, innocent forgetting. You know, there's no agenda behind it. We just forget it because we are absent-minded. And there is something called a deliberate forgetting. Like uh, maybe, you know, we want to forget certain painful events in life or we want to uh, forget certain traumatic events because thinking about them, remembering, remembering them won't add any value to our life. Now, we just want to forget them. Or sometimes we want to forget people who have uh, done harm to us because thinking about them, uh, you know, creates a kind of, uh, uh, you know, let's say a depression or we get a bad vibes thinking about those people. You know, at the personal level, you know, what happens is uh, we do it. For instance, you want to forget a person, we, we try to block them in WhatsApp or in all social media so that, you know, we don't want to think about those people. It's a deliberate way of forgetting them. Um, it's, it's a kind of a deliberate way we want to be away from those people. And coming to poli political forgetting, political forgetting is also a uh, kind of a deliberate forgetting because it has a serious uh, political implications. We know that you know a certain group of people or community or nation or government, you know, they want to forget certain events because those events don't go well with the discourse they have created. And they don't go well with the narrative they have created or because you know, by not talking about them, certain things become easier for them. For instance, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, see the participation of Muslims in independent struggle, right? Uh, maybe some political group or maybe uh, people with political or vested interest, you know, they try to downplay the sacrifices made by Muslims or the kind of participations they had in freedom struggle because there is a political agenda see uh, whenever there's whenever there is independence uh, there's a, whenever an august uh, uh, comes now there will be uh, different stories like muslims groups try to circulate in whatsapp about the sacrifices uh, made by the muslims so that the nation remembers so the community remembers 
and 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 also you can relate it with the example of uh, let's say the partition of 1947. See, this is an important historical event which involves significant forgetting and remembering, because they are crucial in forming of the forming of the identities of different communities. Now, all of us know what uh, you know the partition is. So there was uh, displacement and death of millions of Sikhs, Muslims, and Hindus, right? Uh, uh, for example, like like in, you know, we have something called selective memory, and what happens is the nations, maybe India or Pakistan, they will try to highlight certain narratives, certain discourses that are convenient to them. They're very selective about projections of their memories because thinking about uh, things in an objective manner might not go well with the discourses you know, they have created. And, and this selective memory was driven by political or, or nationalistic or, let's say, religious interest. The same way, each nation also wants to forget certain events. As I said earlier, uh, you know, I mean, they don't go well with the, the, the kind of discourse they have created or it is going to project the nation in a bad light, in a very, very poor light. See. Uh, for example, to give you an example, uh, this Jalin Wallabag massacre, like, you know, you know what a kind of a tragedy it was, now, how many people were killed? <clears throat> Perhaps, you know, uh, maybe the, the, the portrayal of or the depiction of Jolly and Wallabag massacre would not have been a uh, picture, would have been uh, uh, featured in the uh, English textbooks or the textbooks, uh, you know, which is written in England or the history textbooks in England. The reason is, see, when you read the history books of England, you know, they might talk about a lot of other political personages. They might talk about uh, the greatness of imperialism. They might talk about, you know, the kind of good things Britain uh, did as a colonial master. And they might very deliberately omit the, the, the event like Jolly and Wallabag massacre because it is not going to add any value to it. It is going to project the nation in very bad light. And for instance, I mean, this similarly, the practice of apartheid. Like, like maybe in South Africa, like people would not be reading much about it, like how much, you know, like how we do about that. Or even uh, Holocaust, like uh, people in Germany would not have read as much as we have read about the Holocaust. Because, you know, it is very difficult for the country to present a kind of an objective narrative, as I said earlier, because as I said earlier, this is going to put them in a very embarrassing position, very embarrassing state. Even, you know, this, this uh, Holocaust might have been uh, justified under some political context, like uh, how Hitler did it, you know, when he wanted to justify his uh, territorial, uh, you know, his interest in territorial expansion, you know, he brought in a theory called master rush, you know, that this heron rush, this master uh, race, no, according to him, you know, Germans were destined to rule the world because they belong to a special class. So now we, what we understand is, uh, even, even, you know, some nations, like let's say a nation which has lost a war would not talk about it, would put it in such a way that, you know, its failure is not obviously noticed by people or, or it is not recorded obviously in the history books. So what we understand is remembering and forgetting become a process of production of knowledge. And, and they help in creating or constructing or reconstructing a discourse or narrative. Uh, let me give you uh, an example uh, in, in a very lighter vein. For instance, you know, a husband says uh, to his wife, see, your cooking is not okay. And, you know, he, he, let's say she, he says that it is today your food is bad. The way you have prepared, you know, it is not, it is tasteless, for instance. And that accusation or the, uh, that comment 
would trigger all that associative memory uh, of this wife and she will say you know last year you did like this you know you were talking about you know you always complained about my cooking skills you know you did this last month you did this last week you did this yesterday and you never appreciate because she wants to create a discourse that a kind of narrative that you will never appreciate my cooking skills you will never appreciate the kind of efforts i make to prepare food now what will happen now if she also talks simultaneously see yesterday you appreciated me but day before yesterday you didn't appreciate me supposing she talks about the positive things let's say the moments when he appreciated it it would not go well with the uh, narrative she tries to establish she tries to create or maybe that won't shoot the occasion so what we understand is you know there are different kinds of you know uh, uh, i mean i mean forgetting like coming to social forgetting uh, see many uh, this this black americans or let's say uh, people you know they they just want to forget their traumatic past so they don't want to uh, think about it because you know those past has a very devastating impact on their psyche and they want to just forget their years of subjugation they just don't want to uh, you know uh, th think about you know how they were uh, made to feel like second class citizens or you know uh, because see by thinking about them they will never be able to come out of the baggages of the past so they want to forget it socially they want to forget it deliberately so that a new identity can be claimed so they can reclaim their history they can reclaim their tradition and thereby they can forge a completely different identity there's also another uh, you know important concept in forgetting for, for, like never forget for instance you know uh, um you know see, see during holocaust or uh, see people you know those who are survivors of the holocaust or those who were uh, survivors of some tra traumatic events you know, something that has totally devastated them they don't want to forget that event and even not forgetting them also has certain political implications for instance you know muslims you know whenever uh, uh, you know uh, december 6th comes um, they just want to uh, talk about the demolition of uh, babri masjid they they always say uh, marab uh, they we will never forget it so why do they do that this act has a political uh, you know uh, implications so if you want uh, you know, if you want uh, these memories not to be forgotten not to be lost in oblivion it has to be preserved it has to be uh, passed from one generation to another and this is called transgenerational uh, memories and this can be done through textbooks or this can be done through uh, 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 let's say uh, you know movies this can be done through you know various cultural artifacts so people who have first hand experiences of uh, some kind of a traumatic events you know see when when these people die the memories of the holocaust or the memories of the traumatic events will die with them so they don't want this to, to happen and they want to pass on these memories uh, from one generation to another so these people are the first hand uh, you know they have they have the first hand experiences of the holocaust so people you know they want to pass these memories to those who come after them and through various cultural artifacts so then it becomes a kind of a uh, prosthetic memory it becomes a kind of a uh, prosthetic memory so why do they do see by passing on these narratives and by passing on these narratives from generation to generation we want to make a political statement we should not forget it we should never forget that so that so that efforts could be taken to prevent uh, an event of this sort an event you know of this sort could be prevented by not forgetting it so what we understand from this is the act of forgetting and remembering are not very 
you know very innocent activities they are charged with a political one and this has led to the formation of a discipline called uh, uh, you know memory studies so so what we understand about or 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 what memory studies is uh, you know it is a kind of a multidisciplinary field multidisciplinary field which looks at the process of remembering and forgetting it looks at the processes of remembering and forgetting and more importantly the politics behind the act of remembering and forgetting so so uh, memory studies is mainly about the politics behind the act of remembering and forgetting like like it's it's uh, uh, like memory memory studies is also very democratic and very uh, accommodative as it combines academic strands from different disciplines such as psychology or neuroscience or sociology history and philosophy and that's how by uh you know with all these multiple uh, interpretations put together something as objective as something as personal as memory could be converted into a corpus of knowledge called memory studies and as rightly pointed out by madam uh, it emerged in late 20th century and some people say uh, uh, memory studies has its basis on holocaust and its implications so uh, there are a couple of people who have made uh, significant uh, contributions to memory studies and the first one is maris uh, holbox and he is the one who laid the uh, groundwork for this study of collective memory so his book uh, the collective memory is a very important work in memory studies so he says uh, these memories th these memories are shared by uh, the collective memories are shared by a group of uh, people and these collective memories are more important than individual memory or more important than personal personal memory when these memories are placed at the backdrop of a collective memory individual memory gains additional significance gains more uh, thing gains more uh, significance so uh, according to him only by sharing of these collective memories a truly communal identity can develop so with that work so the memory studies the, the discipline of memory studies took off and you also have a couple of other people uh, called uh, you know this pair or nora i'm not very sure about the pronunciation um, um, and you know she talks about sites of memories and then you have uh, elida asman and then you have jan asman and all these people you know they have uh, they talk about cultural memory cultural memory spaces and all these are very important uh, in advancing the field of memory studies so what do memory studies do so they look at the way societies remember historical events especially uh, you know this this traumatic or contested ones because these events can have political implications and they also memory studies also look at the way how memories can be actively shaped and manipulated by individuals uh, institutions or governments to serve various political agenda and and also it, it also looks at the way how selective memories are projected for instance you know a nation will you know, as we discussed earlier a nation will highlight certain memories and it will downplay some mem some memories as it does not go well with the uh, narrative or the discourse they have maintained maybe we were relating it to the example of jolin wallabag massacre or holocaust and even uh, you know memory studies looks at the way the agents of memory like <clears throat> Uh, war memorials or monuments you know how they are used in the construction or preservation of memories and these are all political act in themselves so what they do is uh, you know this by let's say this war memorials 
or monuments you now they also have uh, serious political implications in the sense they try to honor certain figures they try to honor certain political impersonages and they try to downplay others or they try to marginalize others so why should we study uh, memory studies because uh, the process of memory hmm, as i stated earlier they are not innocent activities but they are charged with political undertones and memory as we all know is central to our identity uh, or uh, culture hmm? so uh, by by remembering by studying how societies remember and commemorate certain historical events we can understand we can better understand the formation of national and cultural identities so memory studies is also uh, is also closely tied to uh, personal or group identities so it helps us establish who we are or where we come from and how we relate to the world around us so in a way uh, you know as peter barry talks about uh, you know in his uh, introductory chapter in beginning theory politics is pervasive Hmm? Aristotle says uh, man is a political animal. So to understand the politics behind the seemingly act of acts of innocence in the world, let's say why a country or a nation pro projects a particular uh, narrative, or let's say why a nation projects a particular uh, historical personage. Now, what do they want to do with that? Uh, why do they want to revive a cultural practice you know, which was dead, which went into oblivion? So what do they want to do? And what is the politics behind it? So just to have an awareness about the kind of uh, society you know, we live in, it's important that we have some knowledge about memory studies. Uh, Ma'am, how much time are we left with? Bless you, ma'am. Blessy, ma'am. Blessy, ma yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Sir wants to know how much time is left there. Um, twenty-five minutes, sir. Oh, twenty-five minutes more, or uh, uh... Oh, more? He's he's. Yeah, yeah. Five more minutes. Okay, ma'am. Uh, <clears throat> so coming to, uh, and you know there are different kinds of uh, memories. And I'm sure like uh, those who are going to present paper will have better idea about that. Like, um, you know, you have a collective memory and then you have a social memory and these collective memories, for example, uh, or the shared memories. You no, know, we were talking about that. You know, they, they, are, they are related to a broader uh, group, uh, a nation, a community. And similarly, you have a cultural memory. So a group of people come together because of religion, because of uh, linguistic background, because of caste. So these people have rituals. These people have, uh, let's say, celebrations. So these rituals, you know, they, you know, these rituals are very important and they're passed from one generation to generation and they're preserved as memories. And it is through the, per the it is through the performance of rituals, you know, the identity of uh, the social identity of the group remains intact. And also, we have a lot of other memories called episodic memories and semantic memories. So, how to connect this to literature? And there are a lot of works, you know, which have memory as a recurrent theme. So, uh, uh, according to a scholar of memory studies, you know, writing is an act of memory. Writing is an act of memory. Please remember, right? So, so what we understand is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, a writer transfers uh, his own memories into a piece of work, or a writer transfers his the memories of his community, the memories of his culture into the work, right? So, what we understand is, so the basis of any literature will remain, will always remain memories. So in that way, memory is very, very central to literature. And a lot of works, for instance, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, or uh, Marcel Proud's In Search of Things, uh, uh, yeah, In Search of Lost Time. You know, he talks about something called involuntary memories. Uh, and 100 Years of, uh, you know, 
uh, 100 years of solitude. Now it talks about a collective memory or even Tony Madison's uh, The Beloved talk, uh, talks about the traumatic memory, you know, she, about slavery and how they want to come out of that, how those memories you know, haunt them. Uh, and similarly, you know, all these, uh, similarly, like, you know, you have memoirs and autobiographies and you have cultural memory, you um, know, in, in which is represented in literature. For instance, uh, uh, you know, Chinua Achibi talks about in his novel, you know, the, in, in, in Things Fall Apart, um, he talks about the culture of, let's say, uh, the cultural memory of the Igbo society. And, and likewise, you know, uh, uh, Permal Murugan, for instance, you, tell, you talk about, you know, he wants to uh, talk about the cultural memory of a Kungu community. So a uh, lot of literary works have memory and its implication in various forms and domains. So uh, to end with, and literature and memory studies together, they offer a, a kind of a powerful lens through which you know, we can understand human experience better. Because literature serves always as repository of memories. And it offers insights into how individuals and societies remember and forget and make sense of the past. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, it's indeed a, you know, a great opportunity for me. And I'm so glad the Department of English is doing such, uh, you know, taking great initiative. Uh, I'm so uh, happy to be a part of this event. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Ms. Sai Street to present her paper. Happy evening, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Just give me one minute, please, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, just give me one minute. Yes, ma'am. Is it okay if Vadud can present before you? Then perhaps you could take time and set things up. Sure, sir. Not an issue, sir. Now I invite Mr. Mohammad Wadu to present her present his paper. Um, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Go on. Uh, so let me share my screen to. Uh, Is the presentation visible? So, yes, warm welcome to everyone gathered here to listen. My name is Mohammed Badud, and I'm right now doing my research at uh, Central University of Kerala. So, I'm at my preliminary stage of uh, research. So, please, if I say anything wrong, and feel free to uh, share your suggestions. So, the topic that I have chosen today to present here is effective materiality, memory, and trauma, and then of Michel Gondry's eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. So let's start with a basic introduction of what memory studies is about. 
Memory can be defined as any kind of information about the past that is being stored and retrieved and recollected to the present whenever needed. The information can be about an experience, uh, people, place, or an Memory is an interdisciplinary topic that connects social, cultural, and international phenomena. The field of memory studies analyzes the practice of remembrance and of the past events and how it is associated with the present context. Memory plays a vital role in the public sphere because the social practices and cultural commemoration. Remembering and forgetting are common themes in the contemporary research on memory studies. Some of the central coordinates of remembering and forgetting include religion, identity, and ethnicity. Remembering can be defined as the ability or an act that assembles the accessible images of the past to the present. And because of this, memory cannot be considered as an objective image of the past. Rather, it can be said as the subject's version of the past. And the version of the past changes from one person to the other as it depends on the subject's personal experience with that particular event. Memory can be categorized into different sections into implicit memory and explicit memory. Implicit memory is a hidden form of memory which can, as we follow certain patterns that needs to be analyzed through critical lens, whereas explicit memory can be easily identified. These implicit and explicit memory is further divided into individual and collective memory. The idea of collective memory traces its origin back to 1990s, where it was coined by Hugo of Metzthal. Later, it was Holbox who popularized the term through his phenomenal work on collective memory, which was published in 1920. According to Holbox, collective memory is a set of shared beliefs and habits that belongs to a particular community or a group in a society, which has been institutionalized through certain narratives. And Holbox defines individual memory as a kind of memory that is formed by the interaction of the individual within his or her community. He even mentions that the individual memory is dependent not necessarily with the individual's interaction within his community, because the individual can even form certain memories with his interaction that he makes outside his community. So the idea of memory is always associated with the mind. However, one should also focus on the connection between memory and material objects. Pierre Nora, coined the term sites of memory in his book, Realm Memory Traditions, which was published in 1998. Nora examines how physical spaces and objects such as monuments, museums, and memorials serve as repositories of collective memory. He highlights the significance of materiality in preserving and transmitting memories across generations. Memory and materiality are intertwined in fascinating ways. Material objects such as photographs, keepsakes, or even everyday items can hold deep emotional significance and serve as anchors for our memories. These objects have the power to evoke vivid recollections and transport us back to specific moments in our lives. When we interact with these material artifacts, they can trigger sensory and emotional responses, helping us retrieve and relive memories associated with them. For example, Holding a childhood toy might bring back memories of playing and feeling safe. Similarly, smelling a certain scent can transport back to a specific time and place, evoking memories and emotions tied to that experience. The materiality of objects can also play a role in memory formation and retention. Research suggests that physical characteristics of objects such as texture, weight, or visual details can enhance memory encoding. When we engage multiple senses in our interactions with objects, it strengthens our memory connections and makes the recollection more vivid and enduring. Furthermore, material objects can serve as external cues or me memory triggers. They can act as reminders of past experience, prompting the retrieval of associated memories. For instance, a ticket from a concert can bring back memories of the music, the atmosphere, and the emotions felt during that event. Memory and materiality are intricately linked. Material objects can serve as powerful triggers of material memory retrieval. The relationship between human and non-human entities can go beyond functional or practical value. Objects can become intimate with personal narratives, identities, and emotions. 
They can hold sentimental value, symbolize meaningful relationship or events, or provide comfort and familiarity. This brings out the idea of affective materiality. Affective materiality acknowledges that our emotional response to objects are subjective and deeply personal. The same object can hold different emotional meanings for individuals based on their unique experiences and attachments. Understanding affective materiality can have implications in various domains such as psychology, design, and marketing. It highlights the importance of considering the emotional impact of objects and how they can shape our well-being, memories, and overall experiences. The emotional connection to the material object can be both positive and negative. Positive emotions may arise from objects associated with joyful memories, cherished relationships, or achievements. On the other hand, objects associated with loss, trauma, or difficult experiences may elicit feelings of sadness, grief, or anxiety. These objects may hold emotional weight and can serve as reminders of challenging times. In a post-anthropocentric notion, the precise definition between the social construction of human thoughts and the materiality of physical world is becoming less distinct. This opens up the door to explore how these non-human entities become social agents in the making of our everyday lives. This effective materiality of the objects or non-human entities around can influence the process of individuals' memory reconstruction and psychological trauma. In her book, Vibrant Matter, A Political Ecology of Things, published in 2001, Jane Bennett discusses macro-political and micro-political techniques that discipline the human body and functions. She mentions the idea of material recalcitrance during such process and the authority of things around the human world, which she points out as force or resistant force. She highlights the active role played by non-human materials in public life by bringing the concept of thing. Bill Brown's research article, Thing Theory, introduces the concept of thingness that lies behind the object. He proposes the distinction between an object and a thing. Brown points out how humans look through objects and make them meaningful because of the interpretive attention that they those particular objects. He explains further on the thingness of the objects, saying, I quote, we begin to confront the thingness of objects when they stop working for us, when the drill breaks, when the car stalls, when the windows get filthy, when they flow within the circuits of production and distribution, consumption and exhibition has been arrested. He says that when the object reveals its thingness, there will be a changed relation between the subject and the object. He explains the ambiguous nature of things as they consist of their own generalities and peculiarities which depend on the interconnectedness between the subject and the object. This paper explores how the changed relationship between the object and the human works once after the object reveals its thingness. As Brown mentions, the ambiguous nature of things might adversely affect the individual. The effective materiality is one of the possibilities that might result from cruel optimism. In the book, The Effect Theory Reader, Lauren Bernard speaks on cruel optimism. Berland brings the idea of cruel optimism from the statement given by Emmanuel Ghent, where he talks about the objects of desire and the optimistic attachments that humans have with particular objects. Kent mentions these attachments as a product of cluster of promises that allows us to encounter our senses of endurance with the object. He says that these cluster of promises are embedded in a thing or a person and adds that all the attachments are optimistic. Berlin says cruel optimism is a kind of attachment to specific objects in advance of their loss. She mentions that these attachments happen in compromised conditions of possibility where the object might not serve the purpose. The subject realizes the thingness of the object and the cruelty that she mentions here is the state of the subject who cannot overcome the situation. She mentions how these obstacles to desires make them struggle to change. The effective emotions that lie within the materiality of the object 
after the transformation to things and the cruel optimistic attachment that rises from the subject-object relation become the reason for the individual's memory reconstruction and psychological trauma. From a new materialist ontology, these objects have the power to materialize memories through them. If the subject-object relation is changed, this deeply this depletes the happy memories of the subject and the object of desire starts to haunt the individual. It is because happy memories have no more value and the object becomes a reminder past. And this detachment pushes the individual to encounter psychological trauma as the promise of cluster is broken and to reconstruct the happy past, which is no more. So I'm incorporating this idea of thing theory and cruel optimism to analyze the film Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. So let, let me share a few words about this film. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is a thought-provoking and emotionally charged film that explores the complexities of memory, love, and the human experience. The story revolves around Joel, played by Jim Carrey, who discovers that his ex-girlfriend Clementine, played by Kate Winslet, has undergone a procedure erase all memories of their relationship from her mind. Devastated by this revelation, Joel decides to undergo the same memory erasure procedure provided by a company called Lacuna. As the procedure unfolds, Joel's memories are gradually erased, starting with the most recent ones and moving backwards through their relationship. However, his memories are being erased. He realizes that he does not want to forget Clementine and tries to hold on to the memories of their time together. In the depths of his mind, he creates a fragmented dreamscape where he revisits their memories, desperately trying to preserve their condition. Throughout the film, the narrator jumps back and forth in time, revealing the ups and downs of Joel and Clementine's relationship. As their memories are erased, he begins to question the wisdom of erasing their shared experience and the impact it will have on his identity and sense of self. As the story unfolds, it becomes clear that erasing memories cannot completely erase the emotions and connections associated with those memories. Joel and Clementine find themselves drawn to each other again, even though they don't consciously remember their past together. It reminds us that even the most painful memories are an integral part of a personal journey and that the true connection transcends the boundaries of time and memory. So Joel collects every object that is related to Clementine and gives all of them to Lacuna before the treatment. These objects are a part of Joel's memory of the happy past that he has spent with Clementine. They materialize his happy memories through them. These objects are specifically end-oriented as Joel has placed a cluster of promises tied together with them. In the essay Happy Objects, uh, which is a part of the Effect Theory Reader, Sarah Ahmed mentioned that such happiness associated with the object involves specific intentionality, which she describes as end-oriented. So the central role assigned to them is to materialize those memories into the present consciousness of the individual. It states that human mentality of placing objects as a part of their happiness and expecting them to work in a particular way. Or else we can say that the human expects a desired future. This notion of uh, cruel optimism is revealed here as the relationship between Clementine and Joel breaks down. Joel keeping those things reveals his cruel optimistic nature towards them as he keeps those materials which are a part of an end-oriented process. In the movie, cruel optimism of object is portrayed through characters' attachment to material possessions as meaning of finding happiness and fulfillment in their life. Throughout the film, objects are used as symbols of hope and optimism. For example, he keeps a memento from his relationship with Clementine, a small knick-knack as a reminder of their love. The object represents his attachment to the past and his belief that, that holding on to it will bring him happiness. However, as the story unfolds, it becomes clear that this attachment to objects is cruel optimism. They both attempt to find happiness through material possessions such as erasing memories or holding on to mementos ultimately proving to be superficial and unsatisfying. The film suggests that relying on objects as a source of happiness is ultimately futile. True fulfillment and connection come from genuine human experiences and emotions rather than the temporal satisfaction of these material possessions can provide. Another instance where the subject reveals his cruel optimistic nature 
uh, is when Joel tries to resist the memory erasure treatment and hold on to their attachment to the things even after realizing they changed the relationship. Berlant says this is crueler as the subject undergoes a traumatic phase and struggles to leave their expectations of life. Joel fights back the process of memory reconstruction, putting him in a traumatic state even after accepting to undergo the memory erasure treatment. He decides to hold back his memories with Clementine. As Jane Bennett discusses, um, the object reveals its vital materiality after transforming it into a thing. These things materialize the reconstructed memories of the past through them affecting the individual who endures psychological trauma. Affective materiality, memory, and trauma are intricately intertwined elements that shape our subjective experience standing of the world. Affective materiality refers to the ways in which physical objects or spaces evoke emotional responses and hold meaning for individuals. These objects can become powerful triggers for memory, especially in the context of trauma. Traumatic experiences often leave a profound impact on memory, leading to the encoding of vivid and emotionally charged recollections. The effective materiality of objects associated with trauma can serve as potent reminders, eliciting intense emotional response and reactivating those traumatic memories. The interplay between effective materiality, memory and trauma highlights the complex nature of human experience and memories and the significance of physical world in shaping our emotional landscape. Understanding these conditions can provide valuable insights into the lasting effects of trauma and the potential for healing and resilience. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I now I invite Ms. Sai Street to present her paper. Good evening, ma'am. Is my slide visible? Yes, ma'am. Memory and Literature, Tuesdays with Maury Squats. Memoirs, Learning the Meaning of Life. Every page in this book has something to do with memory because this is a memoir in itself. And uh, uh, Professor Maury Squats had a neurodegenerative disease. And... Uh, what he did was he made his life, the end of life, a lesson in itself. And he wanted to teach through dying. Memory and the processes of remembering is an important topic in literature. And there is enormous amount of literature with respect to memory studies, dealing with memory studies. What the author Mitch Album tries to do is he brings back the memories from the past in the present and he successfully establishes a relationship between the past and the present. Either of their past leading to the present as in uh, autobiographies or that of others. And here in Maurice Watts also recollects a lot of things, associates memory with a lot of experiences, places and even people at times. A recollection of a life changing incident from the past affects the present and it could also change the course of life from there on. The book, the book recollects the past of a person lost in the busy daily routine that is the author itself and Mitch Albin the author is rerouted to his past and into the life of another person from his past that is Professor Maurice Squats. The book talks about the memories, past and the present. Multitasking mind. Um, this is how the book actually starts. The very first paragraph introduces the present. That is the author, what the author is actually doing at the moment when he is meeting the professor, as in when he sees the professor. Busy, multitasking nature of the author in front of our eyes. A cup of coffee in one hand, a cell phone, talking to a TV producer about a piece we were doing. And ends the first paragraph with, this was how I operated, five things at once, explaining task management capacity of human brain. And now he walks down the memory line, the author starts to walk down the memory line. 
the author comfortably intertwines the past and the present in the single paragraph in a single paragraph and how does he describe that at the sight of my old professor i froze because the professor that he saw uh, 16 years back was a different version and what he sees now is a different version at least physically indicating his present mental state at the sight of his professor he continues to provide a time lapse i had not seen him in 16 years and introduces us how his professor might have looked years back as in he does not directly say how his professor looked when he graduated during the time of his study during the time of his stay in the college he just says his hair was thinner nearly white and his face was gaunt and allows us to imagine how the professor would have looked during the author's stay that was 16 years earlier past memory intruding into the present and this is where the author actually struggles the author plays around about how the mind wavers and struggles to handle the situation as in the past comes up alive but this person mitch album is busy at the moment finishing his task and he is actually struggling to handle both at once the author plays around about how the mind wavers and struggles to handle the situation drives around the block a few more times finish the business and get mentally ready he wants to get mentally ready to meet his dying professor he does not fail to explain the blanking effect of the past memory intruding into the present where the memories interfere and prevent him from concentrating on the conversation with this producer hey the producer said the game are you there yeah i am here i was spurred and continued my conversation adds the author indicating the uncomfortability with the situation he is not able to i mean handle his memories handle the memories of his professor and the promise that mitch gave that he would go back and visit his professor but did not do so until he got to know that his professor is actually dying between the lines the author clearly conveys the mental struggle what he should have done but didn't i mean here in the author stresses on the weight of guilt that the author is facing and the conflict of present over past pain about the inevil i mean inability of present over past i did what i had become best at doing which means he says he is best at doing his job i tended to my work even while my dying professor wait, waited on his front lawn i'm not proud of this but this is what i did says the author the word play unambiguously explaining his agony the pain that he has the guilt that he has the guilt that he faces the present clashing with the past and his helplessness about the scene there are multiple places wherein the author uh expresses his guilt as when he has become the professor i mean the person that he never wanted to become as a child the agony is multiplied as the past memory appears very much alive confronting the present the lies and self justifying reasons that we offer to cover up an error or inability i mean inability is echoed by the author told him i was searching for my keys a lie that paints the guilty feeling of the author and he hugs the professor so closely so tightly as if he says crushing the little lie that he has just said by saying the stone walls are had built between my present and my past which means he has not revisited his past for a really long time i had forgotten he exposes how our present ensures that the past memories become invisible and remain inaccessible forgetting present over past memories then in the next pages he turns to visit the past memories where the sweet experiences the the author had with the professor is vividly told in clear detail starting from his day of enrollment wherein uh, mitchell is being called as mitch and the professor is being addressed as coach and he the professor accepts that he is going to coach be the coach for life he also indicates how we lose track of time when past memories overlaps 
and overshadows the present this was something that all of us could relate to we had been talking there for nearly 2 hours says the author indicating how easy it is to get immersed in the memories of the past pages disappear during this 2 hour reminiscence so much past memories taking over present past at times comes back come back and see your old professor a statement which might be seen as an implication of the past coming back to us the professor's question which is more like a statement or even a command you are coming to visit me is like the present thrilled by the visits of the memories from the bygone past and the professor has a lot of reminiscence as in there are multiple people coming to meet the professor share their memories with him and this relationship this uh, sharing together sharing memories together is not because of anything else say not because of faith or anything but basically the bonding between the teacher and the student and the love and the relationship that they share with the question how about tuesday the author had classes with the professor on tuesdays back in the college how about tuesday the author's appointed days of visit with professor the author adds i was unaware of it our last class has just begun effect of present of future continually misplaced priorities keep adding memories to the past from the present that when and if was done life would have been different here in the author says traded lots of dreams for a bigger paycheck and never even realized here the author exposes how our aims and objectives however ideological it might be gets flooded and remains sunk by the drives of the present and sometimes the author says that we even forget what we wanted to become or we become the exact opposite of what we did not want to become effect of cultural memory over people memories come into being through a set of internalized cultural conventions specific to a society as well as a particular setting and professor morris quartz also talks about his stay as a research scholar in a mental hospital he recollects how the experiences that he had in a mental hospital helping and recording observations that he made on a mentally ill patients memories come into being through a set of internalized cultural conventions specific to a society as well as a particular setting hospital school college court of law church etc often times this cultural memory identifies or reprimands people who underperform in its view as in marks in an examination professor mori said during one of the, one of the visits the culture we have does not make people feel good about themselves and you have to be strong enough to say if the culture doesn't work don't buy it he took more time eating and looking at nature and wasted no time in front of tv or movies indicates distraction of this media than being productive or mere recreation the author also compares the uh, professor's style of eating how he used to talk through a mouthful of food and now that the professor is sick is not even able to swallow a, a spoon of soup cultural memory over life's lessons the professor wants that money is not the most important thing contrary to the popular view held by the society the professor even recollects his stay in the mental hospital where he was a research scholar and he observed that many of the mentally ill patients were really rich but they were not happy they were not mentally healthy either and that is the reason why they were in the mental hospital which reemphasizes that money is not the most important thing at least according to the professor he also tells us the need to be fully human he speaks of the alienation of youth and the need for connectedness with the society around us 
one day i'm going to show you it's okay to cry and this statement it's okay to cry mori has been telling mitch since his stay in the college as in when mitch was a student and eventually towards the end when the professor is not able to talk when the professor is in his death bed mitch eventually cries one day i'm going to show you it's okay to cry is an important lesson imparted by the professor as against the cultural belief that men don't cry or only losers cry he used to say the same thing nearly 20 years earlier he declines the uh, author mitch album declines as in he says in 1979 this happened and this is what my professor said this is what my professor said as in it's okay to cry and he declines even in the present as in in 1994 cultural memory over life's lessons the author's statement fatherly conversations that i cannot have with my own father who liked me to be a lawyer this fatherly conversations the author and the professor has been having even in the college day now even as the author i mean the professor is fighting the deadly it still continues after a long gap of 16 years the author statement fatherly conversations that i cannot have with my own father who would like me to be a lawyer explains the expectations of the society parents peers on individuals thereby influencing life's decision you have to find what's good and true and beautiful in your life as it is now looking back makes you competitive and age is not a competitive issue professor's life teaching dying man talks to a living man tells him what he should know the words of the author wets the eyes of the reader cultural memory over life's lesson in a football match the team is doing well and the students section chant we are number 1 we are number 1 at one point professor mori loses patience the professor mori rises and yells what's wrong with being number 2 the professor himself recollects this incident where he just yelled at the student crowd what's wrong with being number 2 yet another life's lessons as against that of the society this is what professor mori says as long as we can love each other and remember the feeling of love we had we can die without ever really going away all the love you created is still there all the memories are still there you live on in the hearts of everyone you have touched and nurtured while you were here he says not to hold a grudge against another person recording the past in the present this is a little touching there are multitude ways of recording present to revisit them as they become a part of our past memories the author here specifies a tool which allows to recollect the discussions but also the voice of the loved respected professor unfortunate he did not have access to smartphones back then the next tuesday i arrived with the normal bags of food and something else a sony tape recorder i want to remember what we talk about i want to remember what we talk about i told mori i want to have your voice so i can listen to it later tape recorder was more than nostalgia yeah. photographs audio and videos are a desperate attempt to steal something from death's suitcase as he and mori squats also asked the author whether he listens to the recordings and when the author responds yes he says the author will remember mori squats and the professor will not actually die because he will live through the memories that is what the professor says does the past die someone asked the professor if he worried about being forgotten after death I don't think I'll be. I've got so many people who have been involved with me in close, intimate ways, and love is how you stay alive, even after you are gone. Answered he. Death ends a life, not a relationship. The author adds 
towards the end of the recollection of the past memories. The professor also argues that to be active is what is to live. He says, when in bed, you are dead. The professor stayed active till the end. And I would like to repeat this line. Death ends a life, not a relationship. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Saistri. I request Dr. Abdul Hadi, sir, to share his view on the presented paper. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Am I audible? Yes. Uh, yeah, so those papers are uh, uh, well researched. Um, and especially the first paper, uh, you know, uh, I, I could learn a lot of things related to the different aspects of affective materiality how it is futile to you know associate a lot of emotions with uh, objects hmm? uh, and uh, he was also talking about uh, concepts like cruel optimism kind of an oxymoron so in a way uh, they threw a different dimensions about uh, or let's say cultural i mean memory studies so my appreciation goes to him and uh, when, when coming to the second presentation fine and this book, I remember having read long back, uh, kind of a self-help book. Um, you know, it's more of a very uh, philosophical in nature, talks about the importance of relationship, memory, life, um, and uh, the importance of living with consciousness. Uh, you know, it's interesting to look at uh, such a book through the lens of memory studies. So my appreciation goes to her as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now the forum is open for the audience. Dear professors and scholars, you can ask questions or share your views. In fact, there are a couple of questions on the chat box for Professor Hadi. I don't know if you've seen that, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. So a couple of uh, trauma and memory are related, sir. Can I tell if they want to forget or they want to if you can see the mind how to handle the trauma and memory? Yeah. Um, see, uh, as I stated in the lecture, um, this memory studies is closely related to the Holocaust studies because this Holocaust uh, includes a lot of trauma, right? So, can you can can you tell if they want to forget? They want if if as it step inside their mind, how to handle them? I mean, this is a very general question. You know, maybe a psychologist should answer these questions. Uh, but then, uh, see, memory studies is uh, you know by uh, it, it gives you a perspective about how to look at your memory. Perhaps when you understand uh, the politics or the process of memory, perhaps, you know, when an awareness about that comes out, uh, maybe uh, this can help us to handle it better. So maybe I think a psychologist can, will be able to uh, deal with these questions in a better way, I believe. 
so i think there's only one question um will it called of what it had exactly how it different from other narratives and literature like we see flashback narrative if it is we upload them agree or disagree if different from other narratives of literature like we see see <clears throat> all these uh, studies no uh, even memory studies uh, personally uh, i do not know how to really comment on this see uh, uh, they they just Uh, come from the central proposition that everything is political in nature politics is pervasive and uh, now uh, you know we we look at uh, different uh, things from a very political perspective and this political perspective leads to a formation of different kinds of uh, you know disciplines earlier an approach towards literature was very holistic and it was very wholesome but now uh thanks to postmodernism and we have different schools of thought different uh, theories um uh, micro narratives you know occupying the center um so now uh, and now what what happens is we have different uh, kinds of uh, uh you know especially this this uh, cultural studies opens that pandora box so now you have studies on uh, let's say hair literature how a hair is portrayed or pr- projected in literature All right how it is also a kind of a political act and you have uh, studies related to food so various kinds of uh, you know disciplines theories you know uh, which have its uh, central uh, preposition uh, tenet that you know there is a political dimension to all aspects of human life so that way uh, the, even memory studies is also a very important discipline Yes. Is there anything? Uh, have I answered your questions or uh, uh, Suruchi ma'am? Hello. Yes. I think there were two questions, and I have. Uh, try to answer to my uh, best yes yes sir uh, we have come to the end of the session so, so, so ma'am hello yeah okay can you hear me yes ma'am yes ma'am all ah, right i just i wanted to add to abdul uh, mr hadis uh, i mean it was a very insightful lecture and uh, both the presenters i think did uh, justice to their uh, presentations uh, i just wanted to i mean i have you mr uh, hadi uh, have you read a book a german novel called lost translation it's a german oh. it's a hans alrich take i found it a little that book a little disturbing because about it's about two brothers the the younger one trying to remember i mean through the reactions of his parents who lost a child at the end of the second world war the elder one they were trying to retrieve that child and uh, through biometric uh, i mean very different kind of uh, you know Uh, calculation some child is found they were they're trying to find out if it is theirs they don't have a dna test as they uh, as we do have now and uh, the second the younger one trying not to uh, i mean uh, and, and not wanting to have that brother back home because he might lose his place it's a kind of a, a little black uh, and at the same time farcical i think he is using a lot of uh, uh, hu- i mean he is using a lot of farcical humor in order to you know f- forget a kind of experience so as you said most of the uh, i mean memory studies that we have some of them very good i think are all about the uh, the uh, I mean holocaust and uh, and maybe the memories of war and losing right that this is german so so naturally it is about the uh, i mean losing of uh, children no at the at the i mean while they were being transported from one part of germany to another 
So I was just thinking whether humor, that kind of, uh, I mean, uh, deliberate uh, erasure of memory, it, all those things are the, in that book, I think, is a very good example of what you said. You said memory is not always uh, all it plays, right? You can play with memory. And that book is a very good example, I think, of how that is manipulated. So, I mean, I just want, I would wanted to, only as you said all these things, you know, I thought I've always been trying to, to, to get the hang of that book fully. It hasn't been, it's a very small thing, but I was, uh, I was more interested in the way the biometric, uh, you know, details about the younger child, I mean, the elder child always goes wrong and the, uh, the younger boy is happy that it is going wrong. But, um, uh, the memory, you know, how he, it's, it's actually a study like this. And I think you have brought that to, to me now, as I recall that book. Thank you. Th thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. For introducing me to a new book, I think mm. I should read it. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, ma'am. We have come to the end of the session. I deem it's an honor to propose the word of thanks. I thank a keynote speaker, Dr. Abdul Hadi, for sharing his valuable insight on memory study. I thank a college principal for her constant su support. I, our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Maria Priti Sinivasan, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, for providing his, this learning platform for the research scholars. I thank all the staff members and research scholars who are presented at this forum. Thank you all. We will meet again after fortnight on 22nd September 2023 with the topic Interdisciplinary Studies Geocriticism. Thank you all. Thank you.